It's great to see everybody. Why don't you guys stand up with us?
so glad to see you you know it's so good to be gathered together with you and I'm praying for God to grant us understanding of his word I have one verse this morning for our text it's first Timothy 6 11 uh, but before I do that um, two plus two yeah very good yeah four that's 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 right that's real good Probably an OSU grad. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. OSU, thank you for beating Notre Dame. Yay, way to go. Uh, my dad was a rabid OU fan, and he always rooted for OU and whoever played Notre Dame. You know, so OSU, thank you for doing that. Uh, Y'all didn't have a whole lot to do with that. But anyway, two plus two, there's... there's Suppose there was a container, there was a little cube that had the answer to 2 plus 2. How big would the container have to be to hold that one right answer? Whatever size the cube was, and that would just be it, right? One right answer, so one little bitty container for that one right answer. What about the wrong answers? How many wrong answers are there to 2 plus 2? Infinite. You know, so you'd have to have this huge container, and actually it would be measureless because you can just keep on going with wrong answer after wrong answer after wrong answer. Well, there's one right answer to who we are, how we got here, and what's our purpose in life. There's one right answer. That one right answer is we're created in the image of God, and our lives are made for Him, for His glory, and for His fellowship. And there's one way to have that fellowship with Him. That's to be saved through that one person, and that's Jesus Christ. But Jesus didn't say that the right answer is a container. He said it's a road. He said there's a broad road that leads to destruction, and many people on it, 
many wrong answers. <laughs> and and I, I've watched society now and for years and years, and it's just one wrong answer after another pops up, you know, just all kinds of strange things that people follow in society. The one right answer is always there. And he said, there's a narrow road that leads to life, and that there are few that find it. How wide is that road? It's as wide as one person. When Jesus said, I am the way, the, ne- the word way means road. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. One narrow road that goes through Jesus. Paul said there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus. Period. Okay, so as a believer in Jesus Christ, what has happened to me? God took me and put me to death and rose me, rose me up to become a new person, and he put me on a new road. I was on a broad road that led to destruction, and now I'm on a narrow road that leads to life. But why did he call it a road instead of a container? Because it goes somewhere. It's supposed to be moving. And what did the Apostle Paul say about his Christian life? He said, I'm, I'm running, and I have a goal that I'm running toward. I'm on the right road, and I'm running toward the goal. And he said, the goal is I want to apprehend that for which I was apprehended by God. Huh? God got me for a reason, and I want to get that reason. I want to attain that reason that he got me. Here's the reason. The night before he was crucified, Jesus said, this is eternal life that they might know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And the Apostle Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know him. He died on the cross for me to save me from my sins, not just so he could save me from my sins, but so I could know him. And that's what I want to do. That's the goal. And then Paul, who said, I want to know him. That's what my life is all about. And by the way, he said, I'm on that road, but I haven't arrived. So if you think you've arrived, we need to talk. Okay? You haven't. But the question I have for you is, are you moving? You're, you, if you're saved, you're on the road. And you don't go off the road and back on the road and off the road and back on the road. This is a Baptist church. Okay? Okay? You're on the road, but the question is, are you moving? Because the Bible says that a person can be overtaken by a fault. Okay, I'm going to get to the passage. But once I get to the passage, I'm probably half done. But you know me. You know, yeah, preacher, you're about half done. I've noticed that. But anyway, okay. You can be overtaken by a fault if you're not moving. Galatians chapter 6 says, if one of you is overtaken by a fault, you who are spiritual, restore that one in a spirit of meekness, you know? So if you're not moving, something will get you. Can I use a cartoon as an illustration? Jay Bird loves country music and he loves cartoons. His favorite is Foghorn Leghorn, but he likes Tom and Jerry pretty much. But here's this cartoon where the cat, Tom, is chasing the mouse, Jerry, but the bulldog is chasing Tom. Okay? Everybody's moving. Now, what happens if Tom stops chasing Jerry? The bulldog gets him. Okay? And in the life of a believer, we're supposed to be moving toward that intimacy with God. We're supposed to be moving toward Christ-likeness. We're supposed to be moving toward knowing him better and better and better. But if we stop moving, we get overtaken in a fault. We get all bound up. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 12, lay aside the sin that so easily besets us. By beset, it means to wrap itself around the legs of a runner so that he trips and he falls and he quits moving. And that happens in the lives of a lot of believers. We have this baggage that we carry into our Christian life. We have our old life that we used to live and we've got all the memories of that. We've got all the temptations that are still there. And if we start yielding to those temptations, we get all wrapped up in something, overtaken in a fault, and stop moving. And so the question, one big question I got for us this morning, each of us to examine ourselves, am I moving? If you want to look at yourself like over the last year, the the indicators are going to be here in this passage that we're going to read here in a minute, but am I moving? 
Or have I been wrapped up in something and stopped and gotten overtaken by the bulldog? Am I moving? Okay, here's the passage. Paul writing to Timothy. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Notice you're running from something and you're running to something. You're on the road. Listen, if you've been saved, you've been put on a different road. And God will not take you off of that road. The security of the believer is all through God's word. It's all through there. Salvation is a gift of God. God gave it. God will not snatch it back. You didn't deserve to be saved, and you don't deserve to stay saved. It's something that God did, and it's something that God will not undo. Okay? You've been born again. You don't get unborn and then born and then unborn and then born and then unborn and then born. You get born again and then you grow. So the question is, are you growing? You get taken off of the wide road and put on the narrow road. The question is, are you moving? You're changed from a tree that bears bad fruit to a new tree that bears good fruit. Are you bearing? That's the big question. Are you moving? Are you growing spiritually? Are you moving toward that intimacy? The Apostle Paul says here, flee from these things which were mentioned before and pursue these things, okay? First of all, it starts out with the word but, which means here's a contrast, okay? So, but is a contrast with something that's been mentioned before, and it's been all about false teachers, And if you were here last week, we talked about how that false teachers were motivated by greed and they were motivated by a hunger for power. And so when it says, but, it's saying, Timothy, you be just the opposite of the false teachers. And remember, it talked about the false godliness on their part, that they believed that godliness was a means of financial gain. In other words, here's this Fake religion where you punch all the little buttons and you say all the right things and you do it because you want to make money off of people, okay? And then Paul says, now that's, godliness is not a means of financial gain, but he said, godliness with contentment, that's real godliness and that's great gain. So the first thing he says to Timothy is, Real godliness is a godliness where you are thankful to God for what he has given you. Even if it's just food and covering, you're, you're thankful to God. But he's not done. Now he says true godliness has something else with it. Righteousness. Look at this. Flee from the old false godliness. Notice it. flee is present tense, which means keep on running. Keep on running. Don't let the bulldog catch you and bite you on the hind end. Keep on running. You know, flee from these things. Keep on fleeing from these things your whole life long. Pursue. You're running from something. You're running to something. Righteousness and godliness. True godliness has a righteousness about it. What do we mean by righteous? What we mean is you give God and people their due that you have a reverence for God, you have a love for God, that's godliness. And you have a respect and a love for people. And I love it when God's word boils it down and makes it simple, okay? I hate to go backwards, but chapter 1, verse 5, the apostle Paul says, the goal, oh, I love that, the goal, one thing, yes, boil it down for me. Love out of a pure heart and a clear conscience. I love God, I love people. I love God more than I used to, and I love people more than I used to because I'm moving. Sometimes I get stuff wrapped around me, and I high center, or I fall down, and I have to get up and dust myself off and get moving again because I haven't arrived. Notice when it says pursue, if you're pursuing something, (laughs) think real deep on this. That means you hadn't got there yet. I think they get that. If you're pursuing this intimacy with God, that means that you hadn't got there yet. And what did Paul say? I have not arrived and I'm not perfect. So Paul didn't get it before he died, and you won't either. 
But if you keep moving, it's going to get better and better. Because what we're talking about is a Christian that's maturing, a Christian that's getting more and more intimate with God. He has a godliness that has righteousness with him, with it, and, and it's getting more and more of the righteousness and the godliness because he's growing spiritually. He's getting victory over sin, and the Bible says that sin can hurt you. Did you all know that? <laughs> that sin can hurt you? It can make you ineffective. It can hurt you physically. It can hurt your relationships. It can, it can kill you. In 1 John 5, there's even a sin unto death for a believer. It can take you right out of this world. It, it, victory over sin if you're moving. If you're moving. But also effectiveness in your witness if you're moving. And also the Bible says that God rewards any kind of good that we do out of a, out of a love in our heart. If you do something out of love, God rewards it. You know, there's rewards. But I think the biggest thing for me, fulfillment. Once again, Paul said, God apprehended me, and I want to get the thing he apprehended me for. He made me to know him and love him. He saved me to know him and love him. He gives me his word as instruction to make me grow spiritually and, and equip me so that I can know him and love him. And so... That's my goal. And then what did he say to Timothy? The goal of our teaching is this love out of a pure heart and a clear conscience. And so, believer in Jesus, here's the question. Are you moving? If you are, there are benefits. The biggest one is really that fulfillment of becoming more and more intimate with God. For example, John John said, you know, I don't really want to categorize people, but there are really basically three categories of believers in, in their knowledge of God, in their intimacy with God. There's the babies. They know God well enough to get saved. He says, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven. And then there are those that know him well enough where they're, they're winning over their sinful, sinful tendencies, and he calls them young men. You know, I, I speak to you young men because you're strong and you've overcome the evil one. But then he says there's, there's an intimacy that goes beyond just knowing him well enough to be saved and knowing him well enough to have some victory over our sinful tendencies. There are those who are called fathers. And he says, I'm writing to you because you know him who is from the beginning. In other words, you're beyond that just knowing him well enough to be saved and just knowing him well enough to have some victory. You're intimate with him. You love him. And that's what I want. And that's where the fulfillment is. Everything that is created has a purpose. And when it fulfills the purpose for which it was created, it's fulfilled. A bird is created to fly. You put it in a cage and you feed it and you water it and you change its papers and you even put another bird in there, great. But you open that cage door and he's going to get out and he's going to fly because that's he, what he was created to do. You and I were created to know God personally. And the more we move down that road, the more we are going to achieve that. Okay, well, John, you've talked about you flee from the sinful tendencies that you saw in the false teachers. And now you, you want to have, pursue that true godliness that has righteousness with it. But he says some other things there, doesn't he? Faith. Pursue faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Question for you. Are you moving? If you are, then that means your faith is getting stronger. Is it? Love. Why isn't love just listed last or listed first? I don't know. <laughs> I'm still working on this passage. But I do know that the Bible says that Christianity is faith that works itself out in love. Okay? You, you, you can't love with God's love unless you have that faith first. Um, by faith, you receive the Spirit of Christ into your life. And how do you describe the character of God? God is love. And so this agape love that you're supposed to have, you don't have it unless you have Jesus. 
You, you invite Jesus into your heart, the Spirit of Christ comes to live within your heart, and now you can love. And so the more that you learn to trust him, the more his love controls you. Got it? If you don't got it, would you please just nod your head and fake it? Yeah, preacher, I get it. Okay, good. Perseverance. This is the word hupomene, which means to bear up under something. And literally what it's talking about is keep on keeping on without quitting. Can you see where love plugs itself into that? There are certain things that I have started out doing and I quit. Coach Green, I coached a women's softball team for about two months and I quit. And you understand why, don't you? Oh, you have a wife right next to you. Be careful. But yeah. You know? I remember yelling at a teenage girl to slide. She rounded third and she was coming home and I yelled slide and she cried. You yelled at me. I yelled slide. You know, what, what's going on here? You know, I quit because... I wasn't motivated by a love for these young ladies and not so young ladies that were playing softball, and, and you know, and I quit. I haven't quit this. I haven't quit this. And some of you that have responsibilities, you've gone through times when you've not seen any fruit, you've not gotten any cooperation. You're, you're frustrated, you're tired, and you're still doing it because you care. That's that perseverance that we're talking about that's motivated by love. Mamas, you ever go through those times with your kids where it's like, I give up? Oh, I can't give up. Why can't you give up? Because you love them. You don't like them at that moment. You don't like what's going on. You're frustrated and you're tired and you're not seeing the progress that you want to see. Why do you keep on keeping on? Because you love that kid. It's not a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. It's, it's an attitude. It's a commitment. And in the same way, Jesus wasn't having nice, warm, fuzzy feelings when he was on the cross. He didn't feel good. He wasn't hanging on that cross with all that pain and all that shame going, boy, I sure do love these people. I've just got such warm feelings inside of me. No. Why did he stay on the cross? Not because of feelings, but because of love. It's not just a feeling. It's a commitment motivated by the Spirit of God. And believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have the Spirit of God, and, he, and Jesus said, He will not leave you. He will abide with you forever. And so consequently, you and I have the capacity, by trusting God and growing in our faith, for the love of Christ to get stronger and stronger and stronger in our lives. And what will come out of that is... You and I won't have to have success all the time and see everything working the way that it ought to, and we might not even get cooperation, and we might even get criticized, but we keep on keeping on because the love of Christ compels us. That's that perseverance that we're talking about. It's not just handling the hardship and, and not going ballistic, but it's you keep on keeping on. Galatians 6, 9, don't be weary in well-doing, for we know that we will reap. We don't quit. Perseverance. Gentleness. It's not just meekness, but there's a kindness mixed in with that word. You, you don't quit because you love people and you're careful with people. You're, you're gentle with people. The fruit of the Spirit, rudeness is not on there. Aggression is not on there. Anger is not on there. And Timothy is a guy. He's a young man. I'm, I'm going to ask you older guys. I don't want to, you to answer it out loud, but are you maybe a little less aggressive than you were when you were 20? Yeah. Especially those of us that have been believers for a while. 
<laughs> I could whip everybody when I was 20. And I was tempted to start. Thank God he protected me. I still have my teeth. Isn't they great? Well, most of them. <laughs> Gentleness. And here you're talking to somebody who's got to do what? He's got to straighten out the problems in the church at Ephesus. He's got to, he's got to teach them the word of God. <clears throat> he's got to appoint elders. He's got to do church discipline. He's got to deal with obnoxious people. I know I've told you before, but when I was in my 30s, I got shoved you're right, Daniel, I'm almost done. I got shoved by somebody, and if it hadn't been for the control of the Spirit of God, and men, I promise you, I, I can't whip everybody, you know that, but I could have whipped him. He was all baby fat. I mean, never touched him. Never touched him. Walked away by the grace of God. That's a gentleness that God gives you by his Spirit out of caring for people. So, wrap it all up, preacher. Question for you. The goal, let's make the goal simple. The goal is cultivate this knowing God. Okay? Get to know Him better and better and better, and His Spirit will take control of you. And all of those things that we've listed, those things are going to be evident in your life, growing and increasing. So, the question is, are you moving? How do you move? First of all, how do you run from something? David put it pretty well. He said, search me, O God, know my heart, and try me and know my thoughts, and see if there's any wicked way in me. In other words, you ask God to show you, which is why you need to have a regular time that you spend alone with God, so that you can say, Lord, would you turn the light on and show me what you see? Because there's stuff I know I need to run away from, and I want to make sure that I'm running away from it. And... He, he will convict you. He will let you know of certain things that you've let creep into your life that don't belong. And you confess those things. And then the Bible says you can ask for grace to help to overcome those things. That's why Jesus said in the model prayer, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. I'm depending on God to help me run from. Well, how do you run to? How do you run to this intimate relationship? Here's a diism. How do you get to know anybody? How do you build a relationship with anybody? You spend time with them. You talk to them. You listen to them. And you do things together. And you get to know each other. You talk to God. You listen to God. You serve God. You pray to God and watch God answer. You experience God. And you get more intimate with Him. You run from things by the Spirit of God saying, here's what I see in your life. You need to confess this. And you need to pray for me to give you the grace to overcome it because you're all wrapped up with something right now. You need to get the stuff off of your legs so that you can start moving down the path again. That's how you run from. And you run to by praying to Him, listening to Him, working with Him. And you get to know Him better and better. And you move from being a little baby to a strong young man to an old father. And you know what? Spiritually, you can be an old father at the age of 12 if you get that intimacy with God. That's what Jesus died for. It's that important to him. And when you and I latch on to that, there's fulfillment. Have you come to the end of the same? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. Since the love of Jesus Christ.
a saint. God bless you.